And then in a moment, I have to unpush this button so we don't hear ourselves in stereo. Uh -huh. Are we live? There we go. Greetings, greetings. Hello, Midwest Elevation. Are you out there? <laughs> Is anybody out there? Let us know. Uh, we are back. It's a beautiful Tuesday afternoon here in the Midwest. Uh, I hope it's beautiful wherever you are as well. We are here with a conversation to raise the collective consciousness here in Midwest Elevation. We strive to do the inner work to see the outer change so that we can all grow uh, collectively and live more joyous and connected lives. Um, I am so excited about our guests today. We are going to be talking about the alchemy of love. Um, and as somebody who uh, loves love and all things about it, I am just super, super excited. So let us know if you're here, if you are live, if you have questions. Let me double check that we are, in fact, there we are, looking like beautiful people on the interwebs. There we go. So let me introduce you to my guests Today, Daniel Boskeljohn and Angela Myas have founded Alchemy of Love as a way to blend Angela's work as a holistic psychotherapist with Daniel's academic work on the philosophy and psychology of love. In her 13 years as a psychotherapist, Angela has worked with hundreds of individuals and couples to help them create deeply satisfying relationships and discover what it means to live an authentic, meaningful life. Daniel has two PhDs, not one, but two, and has presented internationally on the topic of love and intimate relationships. His Making Space for Yourself program for personal development helps empower people to discover their true selves. Angela and Daniel have been featured experts on relationships in many publications, including Parade, Yahoo, Life, Fatherly, Scary Mommy, and Authority Magazine, and I'm so excited to welcome them both here. Welcome, Daniel and Angela. So great to have you. Thank you so yeah. much, yeah. Renee. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So tell us, right? The alchemy of love. How did this all get started? You both have so, done such amazing work, you know, on your own. And then here we are together and you've created this, this amazing work. So tell us how it got started. Well, Angela and I started working together in the fall of 2019, doing a workshop on reconceiving the divine feminine. Mm -hmm. And we had plans to do another iteration of it in the spring but then we couldn't do another iteration of it in the spring. <laughs> right. And at the same time, we had started in early 2020 to talk through the ways in which Daniel's um, research and writing on love and intimacy really matched so well with what I was finding working with couples in terms of really expanding the vision of, of what most people understand as possible in intimate relationships and um, exploring uh, how to help people develop more conscious relationships rather than just slipping back into old unconscious patterns that they sort of observed with their own parents or in their own family. And, um, and then when the pandemic started, uh, I was just inundated with calls and emails from people who are really looking for relationship help. And I had also noticed with the uh, couples that I did work with that I was so often going over the same kinds of topics. And so I started to think, or we started to talk about, um, especially as the online uh, learning became so much uh, more widespread during the pandemic, that there just seemed to be this huge opportunity to be able to reach a lot more couples mm -hmm. with our work. And so that's how Alchemy of Love came about. Love it. So taking the work that you were kind of already doing in this, you said the redefining d divine feminine, is that what this was? Yeah. Reconceiving, the Reconceiving. Feminine was the name of the workshop that we did in 2019. I love that. So how does that connect into the work that you do with couples? Just because I love the whole idea of reconceiving the divine feminine. I want to learn more about this too. 
Um, but obviously it is connected. Um, oh, absolutely. I mean, I, so one thing, one big thing for us is um, just looking at patriarchy and dominator models of, I mean, that go all the way through Western cultures dating back to, you know, pre-ancient Greece and looking at how that has influenced people's intimate relationships, both in terms of couples relationships, but also uh, parenting with children, the ways that uh, schools are run with children. And so, I mean, for us, I think the divine feminine was just accessing all of these other qualities that don't rely on power and control and who you know, who's in charge or kind of trying to gain the upper hand. Mm -hmm. So rather than obedience, it's partnership. And rather than asserting an ideal over a situation, it's looking for what's congruently already there as a whole and just allowing it to come into being and mm -hmm. doing it in a way that's respectful of the whole situation, not just what you want to see or believe is happening up here. Right, right. I love that. And I love that you included too the, you know, the parenting relationships, whether, you know, couples are parents or not, like everything, how we're sort of trained to be in relationship to other people in the world is, is, you know, comes from that very beginning. <laughs> It really does, Renee. I mean, that's, I think that this is something that I explain a lot to couples in uh, my therapy work, but we've also included in our uh, Lovecraft program, which is our year long uh, relationship program for couples is that we actually are never taught how to resolve conflicts or differences in a way that doesn't rely on power. And so, you know, ch as children, we are you know, we're doing something wrong and a parent or a teacher comes along and is like, stop doing that, right? And this is what you need to do instead. And so what I think we learn as children is that, oh, the way that problems are resolved is that the person who has more power just kind of dictates what the solution is going to be. Mm. And so then you get two people who come into adulthood with that model and suddenly they're trying to resolve conflicts but that doesn't work in equitable adult relationships. And right. That's where I think a lot of couples tend to run into some difficulty figuring out what the alternative is. And then the alternative that a lot of people choose is compromise where neither person is happy and neither person goes, gets what they want. And then nobody can admit that they're both not happy with the thing that they both don't want to have happen. <laughs> right. so then you, but then you also forget to stop talking about it. And so there's this huge avoidance gap and communication gap that puts people on parallel paths that's yeah. functional, but not really aligned with flourishing. Oh my gosh. I'm writing these words down because um, they're amazing. Um, but just the idea of compromise and that nobody's really happy and that, you know, for me, I mean, I could just speak to myself personally, when I hear the word compromise, I feel like I'm giving up or sacrificing something and like, I'm like, oh, there's gotta be another way, like for, you know, everybody to get what they need, not necessarily what they want, but what they need and, and go from there. But also I really love too, how the idea of being functional in a relationship, like, yeah, it's working versus what did you, what was the other, not Flourish. flourishing. I knew it was an F word. I was, I was like, it's not fruitful flourishing. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, if, if we set aside that kind of, uh, problem solving through the person with the power dictating what it's going to be, and we set aside compromise, what opens up is this whole realm of creative exploration of, as you said, you know, what are, what are each of us needing, right? What are, what are the desires that are underlying that? And how might we find some way of working through this that actually brings us together mm -hmm. rather than kind of keeps us apart or feeling either vaguely unsatisfied or really unsatisfied. Right, right. Mm, that's beautiful. What do you say to couples who say, well, I don't have time to talk about this stuff every single day? <laughs> Does that come up? Well, that's, um, I don't know that I've 
we've ever actually heard exactly that. But I, I think, I mean, it is, it is hard, right? Because it's, it's learning a brand new skill. It's like um, picking up a musical instrument, right? You're not going to be playing beautiful music the next day right. and you need to practice. And so, but I think what I would say is that um, we can put our time and energy into things that are actually going to lead us toward the life that we really want to have, or we can put our time and energy into um, those kinds of repetitive circular arguments that couples find themselves getting sucked into again and again, where it's almost like we're two actors on a stage and we're each, we know what the other person is going to say and we know what we're going to say and okay, well, and then we're done with it for today and we'll be back here again tomorrow. And so, I mean, yeah, I think it can be, feel a little scary. You're definitely venturing into the unknown once you get out of those old habits of conversation. But that's part of what we want to help people learn to do is to take the unknown as something joyful and wonderful and amazing that you can be co-curious about and look look forward to exploring together rather than the unknown is being like, well, it could be worse. And I think a lot of people are stuck in that, well, it could be worse. And if it's worse, I don't want it to be worse because this is at least functional. Mm -hmm. But the avoidance of what could possibly be worse and accepting that you're not happy because something else could be worse than this, like the whole option of actually really being happy is off the table for a lot of people. Right. Why do you think that is? Like, I'm curious about that. And I think we all are, are scared of the unknown, right? And so it's, I think that it's, that's that natural kind of fear. Um, and I do think that reframing it as an adventure, and, and that's sort of how we see our roles. It's like, we're not just sending you off into the wilderness alone. Like we're right there with, and we, we've done this before, right? We're, we're so it's, sort of kind of hoping for more of an adventure and less of like just just being out in the wilderness alone but you know I on, on average couples who are unhappy wait six years to go to couples therapy and it's heartbreaking on the end of being a therapist is thinking like oh if I had seen you <laughs> four years ago we would have a lot less to heal from in terms of the wounds that happen in relationships yeah yeah. Well, and I'm, and I'm glad you mentioned the therapy too, because, you know, in, in, in the opposite of looking at it as an adventure, right? If what you are offering through Lovecraft is an adventure for couples to learn and grow, that just that alone feels so different to, on hearing that for me than like, oh, we need to go to couples counseling. <laughs> oh, yeah. If that was a big thing that we, as we were developing Lovecraft was thinking like, how do we actually create an experiential program where people can have the experience right there of being close and connected and having a meaningful experience together. That's also fun because I mean, I think that there are a lot of parts of Lovecraft that are really enjoyable and also thinking about my work as a couples therapist I don't know that anyone is ever like wow that was fun right. that was a great hour so but it's also doing it at home and so that's one of the things that we realized with the pandemic is that people might benefit rather than saying like oh I know how to do these skills as long as you're sitting with us in an office right right you're, you're experiencing these things in your house and you're already in your house used to orienting at your relationship and at your lives together in a very different way, but it's not in an artificial setting, it's actually in your home environment. And so right. you start to have all of those new memories and new, new habits of interaction ingrained where you live in a day-to-day -day way rather than somewhere else. So you have your like public selves or right. your therapy office self yes. versus home self. And as soon as you get home, the, the whole space is set up with the dynamic where you behave in one way versus another. Yeah. And so we are hoping to kind of blend those worlds together. Yeah, that's kind of genius. So that's like a blessing of the pandemic that you had to kind of come into people's homes in this way with your work. Yeah, um, really, I, I don't think either of us had really thought about, I mean, we had talked about 
doing longer experiences like retreats and things like that. But the whole idea of creating a year long program where people just get like two hours a week of having this, this time together, that is absolutely a blessing of the pandemic. Yeah. Well, and having couples commit to something like that on a weekly basis and to have the, the accountability through the program and the support, you know, rather than just saying, okay, we need to have like a date night and then, you know, things happen or whatever, somebody's tired or you get ahead, <laughs> you know, it's like there's finding other, if, you know, when left up to the couples, other sort of excuses, um, but allowing making the commitment to that time and then having your program as that um, support and accountability, I think is just amazing. And it also takes it off because it's sometimes a lot of work even just to clear the time. And then if yeah. you like also have to figure out what to do, it's just like, oh, well, I mean, there's got to be something new on Netflix somewhere. Right. But, and, and that's all you have left because right. you're, you're tapped out just to get that two hours. And so we decided that if we were there to provide something really inspiring that you don't have to think of because we're the people who thought of it yeah yeah and it's all things that that uh that couples can feel good about when it when those two hours come to an end that it's actually like an enjoyable experience versus just doing the same old same old or right. couple therapy so right right i love that i love that what an experience so for um, anybody who's, you know, either listening to us live right now or watching the replay, um, who's intrigued about this, but not quite sure if they fit, you know, the profile necessarily um, for this kind of work, uh, what would you, what would you say to them? Well, I would say, I think one option would be we have a free program that is uh, like it's an at-home date night that we brought these um, couples therapy exercises for intimacy and communication. Cool. Um, I mean, one interesting part of our entire Lovecraft program is that research shows that when couples sit and watch a relationship themed movie together and then talk through questions afterwards, have a discussion, that they get as much benefit out of that as couples who go to couples therapy. Oh, wow. I think it's really interesting. Um, so we, we made that part of our program. But that, I mean, starting with something free, but also just, I think if you're wondering whether it's something for you and in your relationship, I would, I would say if you reflect on whether you think your relationship could benefit from having more clarity about what you would like your relationship to look like, Mm -hmm. If if that seems like something that would be helpful, that's really the core of what we do in our work is really help couples to find that unique vision for the two of them for what they want in their relationship. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's what, that's what that's what keeps it. That's what I think the other so the other the other half of the coin is the kind of self help therapy books or the relationship books that you can get that tend to diagnose a problem and give you a solution and then you put it down and then two weeks later you're kind of you, you know and so I think that the way that we really try to work experientially to help people personalize it and then live out that new personalized vision mm. differentiates it. Yeah. That's beautiful because then it's really like couples are working together to create what they want yeah. well, and identify what they want. Right. I mean, first to even know, because some people probably, you know, I don't know what I want my relationship to look like. I just know I don't feel great. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, I, and I think that, that that would be true for a lot of us is, is like, um, it's so easy to just be reacting in the moment to what those frustrations are. And especially, I think, you know, if I think we can all relate to having been in an argument where it's like you see an opening to really get the other person by, you know, a really, really good comeback. It's hard not to take it. But I think that what, what we've seen with couples is that once they have a strong sense of what, what they want their relationship to look like, it's a lot easier to stay focused and oriented toward that vision rather than those more sh short-term frustrations that every relationship runs into. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. It's like keeping the common goal at the, at the forefront. Uh, and is, is what I'm about to say or do <laughs> going, moving in that direction or opposite? That's, the, that's exactly the question. Yeah. yeah. But it's hard to have a long-term relationship with a lot of short-term victories that backfire on you because that's a definition of unhappiness, right? To have something that you're in for the long-term, but it's a lot of really short-term mm. ups and downs and spikes and difficulties. And that's, nobody's happy with that. Right. And, and we really want to elevate consciousness and help people just be happy. Yeah, right. I mean, at a really basic level to, <laughs> to enjoy being in love. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I always used to hate it when people would say relationships are work. <laughs> like, not that I thought it was easy or that it should be easy, but like just the baggage of the word work felt like heavy versus, you know, something like an adventure or something to thrive with and just to enjoy. Yeah. I think, I think relationships are a process and a journey, right? Yeah. And so I like those words better. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, I've also reacted really negatively to the idea that relationships are work. Um, but as I've sort of reframed my idea of what work ought to be, then suddenly <laughs> that, that can kind of shift things up as well. Yeah. But I think that, um, I mean, relationships are so core, not, not just romantic relationships, but our relationships are so core to living a meaningful life that it's certainly somewhere that you want to invest care and attention. Mm -hmm. And so if, even if our relationships are challenging or present a challenge, challenges are what make us excited, right? Challenges are actually, that's why we play games and do puzzles <laughs> or take classes or read books, right? There's a challenge involved. And if there's not enough of a challenge, things get really boring and flat. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people are scared enough of like looking at things as being a challenge that things fall flat Yeah. and in a really kind of dry and boring way. And so, which, which also goes back to if, when we don't know how to work through conflict, then we tend to avoid it because right. it's scary. But I think, yeah, challenges are what allow us to grow as humans. And so thinking of intimate relationships as being, I, I read one author describe it as like people growing machines, right? It, it like <laughs> containers, right? It's like the things will come up in our intimate relationships and and we when we have the skills to be able to work through them it really does allow us to have closer relationships yeah that's true yeah the word challenging is is you know more fun than work <laughs> like but it's it's funny that i said that and as soon as uh angela as soon as you said yeah you know kind of redefining what the word work is i was like wait I use that in my tagline, right? We do the inner work. And I'm like, for, and that doesn't like, <laughs> that's perfectly fine. But suddenly when somebody else is in the picture, work doesn't, I don't know. I've got some work to do. But at the heart of it, when people say relationships take work, it, it, it is really an expression of a sense of, well, you're not really, you need to decrease your expectations for what's possible in a relationship. That relationships are hard and maybe not that rewarding. And yeah. so I think that that's, my guess would be that that's what you're reacting to. Yes, yes, that for sure, for sure. Versus the growth that can happen, you know, every, you know, every, uh, Every challenge is an opportunity to learn something Absolutely. about yourself and each other. Well, before we, we've got just a couple minutes left, if anybody's got questions, please put them in the chat for us. But also I did want you to mention, so for any of our listeners who are not currently coupled, um, to talk a little bit about um, the alchemy of self. Uh, cause I know that's the yeah. piece and as somebody who, um, firmly believes that you have to do that work on yourself in order to even be in the relationship, <laughs> like, 
yeah. yeah. And so all of, I mean, exactly that is a lot of it, the heart of what we're doing with Alchemy of Self. It's identifying that a lot of the qualities that help us be successful in our relationships with others, whether it's a romantic other or whatever other is involved, requires a lot of deep work. But that that's really where joy is. And that if you try to look in other spaces to find joy or contentedness or peace or happiness, you'll always fall short. It really starts here. And then it expands outward and it just overflows outward as long as it's also here. And so couples can support each other in doing that kind of self-work and in, in, with what we're doing, or you can just be alone and do it, or you can do it as a couple. And I mean, you can kind of do whatever, but it's, go ahead. Yeah. Well, we, we really looked at it as, as like, obviously we wanted something also we don't, um, we don't want to exclude people who aren't in partnerships or who are in partnerships where they, their partner isn't necessarily interested in this kind of work, yeah. but to just experience the way that that personal growth that can come when you really tap into your inner wisdom and recover the, your, the, the most joyful parts of yourself as a child and heal re your relationship with your body. And there are so many things that go into yeah. being a, a flourishing adult, just yeah. individually. I think that's, we we're both really excited for alchemy of self for that reason. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. So does your year long program, um, do you have a single start or is it rolling enrollment? Yeah, it's just rolling so people can sign up whenever makes sense for them. And then it just continues for the year. The year. Yeah. Awesome. Well, so beautiful. I'm so grateful to you both for taking the time to be here and talk with us here in Midwest Elevation about the alchemy of love. I'll be sure to put links in the comments here for everybody if they want to check out your website and maybe snag that free uh, date night. Uh, I'm going to look that up. That sounds fun. Um, <laughs> and anything else. Um, any last words of wisdom for us? I we, we could just talk for hours about this. So thank you so much yeah, for having you. us. It's been a really enjoyable conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And all the best to you all. Uh, Midwest Elevation, we will be back next week for another conversation to raise the collective consciousness with uh, Jen Cormier, and we will be talking about grief and healing that, working through all that. Uh, I'm so excited that she will be joining us next week. So uh, we will see you then. Thanks, everybody.